Um, we have Scott Turnbull here uh, with us today, and he's from U.S. Ignite. Scott Turnbull is a national technology leader for U.S. Ignite. Um, U.S. Ignite spurs the creation of next-generation applications and services that leverage advanced networking technologies to build the foundation for smart communities. The nonprofit organization helps to accelerate new wired and wireless networking advances from research to prototype to full scale smart community and interconnected national deployments. Hello, Scott. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, we have an associate DJ, DJ Noon, with us. Um, she went hey, to. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks. She also, she also went to Berkeley. <laughs> Yeah, go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today's topic is um, is on US Ignite and the building the foundation for smart gigabyte communities with the next generation of the Internet. So, Scott, tell us about yourself. Thanks. Um, well, I have a pretty varied background. Um, I started in technology quite a few years ago, more than I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I started out really on databases and the intelligence corps in the United States Army. And I worked up, uh, my education is actually as a microbiologist. But I mostly worked protein databases and uh, genetic visualization and so forth. And then I moved into uh, academic IT at universities. I was at Emory University for a number of years, uh, University of Virginia as well for a number of years. And then I worked in IT in the public safety sector. I, I was a uh, technical section chief for the Mid-Atlantic Response Team for the East Coast uh, for special events. So uh, pretty varied background. Then I came to US Ignite and brought that energy to uh, to the nonprofit. Really enjoy working with the various communities across the country and all the, the app developers I get to meet. By far, the most favorite part of my job is talking to the app developers. Um, so tell us a little bit about US Ignite and what's their mission. What are you guys doing? How are you guys changing the world? Yeah, great. You, I think you captured pretty well. I think you've read the blurb from the website, which is great. We love to see that message out there. But we're basically a nonprofit that was inspired by activities at the National Science Foundation at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, to really d develop a nonprofit that helps uh, spur the, the creation of next generation gig and advanced gigabit, app uh, gigabit networks. And we want to uh, uh, spread the adoption of that through the creation of gigabit applications. So we work with, with cities across the country, also in Australia, to identify their most promising uh, innovators and their promising developers and find applications that are really doing things that you couldn't find on the normal Internet right now and bring those to market and help prove the value of these networks with the hope that it sparks the economy in these cities, that it sparks a whole new generation of, of thoughtful, and interactive, and smart applications in each one of the cities and really makes these cities responsive to the people living in them. Um, so before we move on to some of the questions I have, I wanted to really go back to the basics of language and sure. vocabulary. What is a gigabit? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. You know, if you're, if, no matter how long I do this, it's always the point of most confusion. So <laughs> we really talk about it, it. It's really everyone thinks of the throughput of the network up to a, a thousand megabits per second. It could be, but really we're targeting anything over the typical broadband network. Broadband is nationally defined as 25 uh, megabits per second down. Excuse me, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, down and five up. And so anything really that exceeds that, that couldn't run reliably on current networks is really sort of in that gigabit con continuum. So from that, just above broadband up to the full, you know, 1,000 megabits per second, that's the, that's the gigabit networks. We also add two sort of dimensions to that, though, besides just regular throughput. We also focus on real-time responsiveness. So there we get into edge computing, which is just a fancy term for a very, very close computer, so that even... Um, Applications like driving, self-driving cars, or maybe uh, uh, distance music, uh, collaborative music performance programs, the, the latency for these need to be so low, like below, uh, below 10 milliseconds, that even speed of light becomes a concern. You don't want to be sending photons out to the East mm -hmm. Coast if you're running a car on the West Coast. So we want to put it right at the city edge, or even, even better, maybe a distributed cluster right there on smart uh, light posts in the city or something like that that can really respond below 10 milliseconds below anyone can react or, or think or notice. And then the last bit, the third pillar, is what we call software-defined networking. Right now, networks are really just, they're these kind of broadcasts that send out to publicly available addresses out there for everyone to see. 
And you can do some things like firewalls and protect traffic, but really software-defined networking is starting to get in much more intelligently routed networks that can pick certain systems that can interact with one another, both based on the system or on the application running them. They're highly customizable so that, that systems that shouldn't be visible to the world may not necessarily be. And we can optimize traffic so you can put a lot more traffic on those networks. You can secure the systems and applications running on, on them in ways that you never could before. And you just have much more control over it. So it's those three pillars that we define sort of advanced. That's the advanced portion of advanced gigabit networks. I used to um, work at Cisco Systems, um, and we basically compare the internet with like trucks. Um, so yeah. trucks basically have like little packages on, on it and it runs on little rolls. <laughs> so right, that's right. kind of like the internet, um, you know, and that's the analogy that we always use at Cisco. Um, so what is the, what is the Genie network? I, I mean, I, I looked it up, um, earlier a few months ago about Genie and Gigabit and, and, you know, do you have any opinion about Genie, G-E-N-I-E, -E, I think. That's right. That's right. And I actually, I have to beg forgiveness. I don't remember the acronym what it stands for, but it's a, basically it's a research computing infrastructure that's national. Mm -hmm. It was backed by the National Science Foundation. It's housed at, at I think, 77 systems that they have there, mostly mm -hmm. housed at universities right now. And it's aimed at computer science researchers who want highly configurable systems that they can try experimental new networking protocols or net, uh, algorithms to control networking protocols or just an experimental platform for a network set of systems. And so that's really what it's found, founded for, is to provide uh, computer science faculty with a test bed that they can really develop next generation protocols and next generation systems and optimize traffic on it. And that's really what it is. It's backed by internet too. So these, uh, these racks that uh, are sitting, bare metal racks are sitting at these various universities. Internet two has built special VLANs between mm -hmm. them, which work on their advanced layer two service and provides ultra fast connectivity between all of them. And it really can also serve as a distributed compute cluster. So you can stitch resources from one unit rack to another, and they can they can form a virtual environment as if they were a single uh, bare metal rack for the, from the point of view of the user. So they have a lot of flexibility there, and it's really aimed at research. The, um, just going back to U.S. Ignite, um, there is um, something called the Smart Gigabit Communities Program. What is that? Mm -hmm. And I know that you're a part yeah, of that. Yeah, that's right. And I really, um, that's the primary program that I work with at US Ignite. And that really is a, it's a co taking the mission of US Ignite that helps, uh, that helps promote the, the, the deployment of advanced gigabit networks through the development of advanced gigabit applications. That's really the core of what we do. But we've targeted a cohort of cities. There's over 20 now, uh, mostly in the US with one in, in Australia, Adelaide, Australia, which is a great partner of ours. And each one of these cities has made a dedicated uh, investment and effort in local networking architecture. Uh, they've also dedicated to finding their local application developers to build applications that run in their local networks to prove the capabilities of those over and above the sort of the normal networks that we have right now. So again, we have 20 cities. Um, it, it, is, it compromises not just gigabit applications, but something we call the digital town square, which is really it takes the idea that a community should be able to freely exchange with each other uh -huh. and uh, an application should be easily deployed in them. And it, it really creates local exchange points in each community so that all the gigabit providers, their traffic doesn't need to leave, leave the region. That analogy you had before of a truck is really a great one because people don't really realize it, but you know, these you can have two computers on uh, five feet away from each other on completely different networks, and you, that traffic between them might hop out to some other city mm -hmm. before coming back into that other system. So we want to build short routes, short response times, and really configurable and uh, software-defined networking on a local scale, and the, and really find the applications that can be deployed to them to show the capabilities of them. And that's really what Smart Gigabit Community is about. What are some of the cities that um, is in that community? Well, we have a bunch. I said it's over 20. So, like Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Kansas City, uh, Kansas and Missouri, Austin, Texas, uh, San Diego, California. Uh, we have uh, Madison, Wisconsin. We have a uh, broad area. Uh, we call them cities, but uh, sort of central, the Triangle area in North Carolina is another one of our areas. Mm -hmm. uh, practically the entire state of Utah. 
So there's quite a few there. Annalita Australia is our, our furthest city. Uh, we just did a great demonstration with them there to show the possibilities of transatlantic connection between Internet 2 and their equivalent there in Australia. We were able to do some uh, a virtual training environment for solar people who are interested in exploring solar power plants. Uh, we broadcasted it from Lafayette, Louisiana, who is also another one of our cities, and uh, and we, we broadcast a live VR environment to uh, to Adelaide, Australia. Oh, awesome! Um, I am I'm, I'm interested. I, I'm um, actually putting a fusion conference together on uh, November 14 on um, nuclear fusion um, and energy, and so you know that that interested me. Um, how That's about... great. You guys got to get busy. We need some fusion power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, so what, what about the platforms for advanced wireless research project? Um, how is that different from the Gigabit Communities Program, and how is that, you know, um, different? Sure. So that's another sub-program of U.S. Ignite. That's also a partnership with the National Science Foundation, as is the Smart Gigabit Communities. I hope I mentioned that, but that's directly um, a program that was initiated by the National Science Foundation under U.S. Ignite. Power, similarly, was also initiated by um, the National Science Foundation. That is, their focus is wireless. So they're mm -hmm. out there to establish test-fed wireless cities across the country, similar to Genie in that way that it's really a, the city will develop a, a, an infrastructure that researchers and businesses can come in, deploy experimental wireless technologies in the community, and really make that conversion rap more rapid mm -hmm. so we can get to 5G much, much sooner nationally. It's been a, a sort of a, a, a thorn in everybody's side in the CS community because Europe has had several of these test bed communities and it's really sort of a, um, expedited their adoption of next generation wireless technologies that the U.S. didn't really have a strong test bed. So now we're going to build five of them nationally. It's really going to provide a lot of diversity with different focuses in different areas. Some are going to be millimeter wave focus. Some are going to be 5G. It's going to be sort of all over the all over the map, but it's going to provide enough diversity that I think we're really going to push uh, the researchers to be able to get in and do something new and innovative, but also really allow businesses to get in there and develop sort of um, practical, implementable technologies to create a business model. Awesome. Um, you no, know, I was just... I was going, I was reading um, Porn Over US Ignite.org um, website and just reading about the different programs. So, since Scott is here, I get to ask him all these questions about them. Sure. sure. Um, the next one is going to be Cloud Labs. And um, I read it and it just sounds super interesting. You know, what is that and why do you guys have that? Sure. So it's it's not headed. That that's a sub program. Uh, we a partnered program with US Ignite. I think it's run out of University of Utah actually, but the um, uh, but it's in collaboration with the University of Madison and several others. So that takes the Genie framework and it really mm -hmm. scales it up so that it becomes a true academic research cloud based environment. So researchers of all kind can use this sort of virtual uh, virtual environment deployment strategy strategy of Genie and the, the resource stitching capabilities of Genie. Uh, and these are seven, these are other genie racks that run that researchers can basically run a research-based cloud. So any uh, it's not just limited to uh, to computer science researchers. In this case, it's open to uh, a protein specialists or a physicists or anybody who really needs to do research heavy research computing. It provides a great research cloud uh, platform for them to modify and use as, as they need. Awesome. Um, so. Now let's really talk about what really, um, how are we going to improve the lives of, you know, the people in, <laughs> in the world? Like, how are we going to change the world? Um, oh let's, let's really yeah, talk about that. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. No, I love this. So really, I mean, I, so getting to see what people are actually doing, how we're going to do it is we're, I, everybody feels like we're at this precipice of something new, mm -hmm. but everyone thinks what that new thing is, is something different. I would say that actually we're thinking about that problem wrong, that they, we keep expecting to find a new thing, you know, singular <laughs> or a total small set, but that's not what has happened in the world. This is, might be, certainly the world, history has shown that, it, that, that times can be disruptive. So when the electrical light came around, certainly that was disruptive. Gasoline cars, <laughs> certainly disruptive. But 
this is the first time in history where we have several major technologies all sort of advancing at once. Machine learning, self-driving cars, uh, computer vision. Uh, we have new cellular technology. We have tablets. There's a lot. And then that's just in the computer science space. You get over to CRISPR and you get into lots of other um, sort of advancements in science. And we really have a disruptive time. And as people have talked, um, we're, we're sort of at this precipice, and, but, but people talk about things coming, but not quite sure what to do with it. So I think we're, we're stuck in this mentality of resource scarcity. Mobile yeah. computing is maybe done a little bit to us, right? We, we're used to thinking, oh, like, ah, I got to compress my JavaScript file or my CSS file for mobile loads, <laughs> right? That's, that's what we're sort of thinking. But now we're hitting a world where that's not as, what, what could we do if we didn't have those constraints? then that's sort of what gigabit technology is about. So what happens in that world is the, the world becomes not just a sort of an ivory tower that you have to react to, but the, the cities that you live in, the cars that you drive, your, um, your online presence all become reactive to what's happening in your life. So your hospital might be able to accurately develop through a combination of AI and doctor-mediated um, guidance, develop personalized treatment programs. Uh, your cars may... Uh, you know, may, may be able to, to get maintenance on their own uh, and sort of ease that burden on your life. Uh, you can get a better picture. You don't just turn on switches and power just gets sucked up like a straw, but it might be intelligently routed to different sectors of the community and balanced much better. So you, to me, you end up with this very, uh, very responsive life that they, mm -hmm. it, your, your life in a city becomes almost individualized. Now, taking that a step further, I think if people talk about where the jobs are coming from, like one of the everyone's anxiety is all oh, the jobs are going to go, machines are going to do jobs. That's that's a that's a load of horse you know horse donkey. It's not really going to happen in my opinion. Because <laughs> uh, I can't reconcile these these two facts. Everyone says all the jobs are going away on one hand, but on the other hand, everything's falling apart. And nobody can fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't reconcile those two things. And if you look at sort of this idea of self-driving cars or, or maybe automatic delivery through Amazon robots or mm -hmm. drones that are delivering stuff or automated public response, you're going to have so many jobs needed to just fix the roadways so that self-driving cars can run well enough, embed sensors in them, run maintenance on those sensors, fix cameras that are going to be required for, uh, for computer vision to, to schedule your appointments and, and help you get that tailored personalized medical care that might be coming down. I think that's the transformative nature of what's coming forward. It's just we're locked into this mindset of sort of a page load with maybe backed by a data table off of some database. We're, we're locked in that mindset and maybe mobile, but we really have to get to adaptive systems that are in some case self-healing, that we're participating with to help guide them and make them a mediated uh, uh, technology. Uh, but I think that's really where this transformative sort of, it's not just access anymore, it's adaptive, adaptiveness of the city. Yeah, I'm just thinking about um, in the old days when most of us as agriculture and how that changed when, you know, doing mm -hmm. industrialization and, and, you know, the, the middle class was really created um, doing industrialization and, and culture has to change from farming to city. Um, and a different yeah. kind of city as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that. I um, visited Napa Valley on last Saturday and it, it was just, I'm just excited about, you know, computation um, and wired, wired and wireless technology because, you know, I was trying to stream <laughs> the, the right. Napa Valley um, on uh, Facebook <laughs> and also on Periscope, right. but I could not do that um, because my connection is poor. And I right. think, you know, the cell tower was burned down. Um, I was at Tubbs Lane where the Calistoga, you know, where the fire started. And, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, I can't do anything except, uh, you know, take pictures and videos on my, on my phone. And, you know, that, right. that got to change, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's going to take reprioritizing, reprioritizing sort of how we view capital expenditures, uh -huh. uh, certainly at the city level, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of, like, Capital expenditures have to go to improving the lives of the people in, this, in the community, whether that's a city or a rural community, almost irrelevant. I, I do think we're heading towards a more distributed culture, mm -hmm. which can be a good thing. But we need these rural areas need that connectivity. I mean, I would ask the question, it's, it's not just sort of live streaming to Periscope, but let's say those the people who are running those vineyards or their agricultural farms, if they want to put out IoT devices that monitor the health 
of the plants for mm -hmm. determine if you need water on those plants so you can conserve water and target your watering plant. If you if you want to look for fungal spread or you want to look for wildlife that's coming in or danger or safety or fire detection, those are all going to take ubiquitous coverage of wireless technology and I think reliable on top of it. So I think that that's absolutely critical sort of in the future world. Yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking, you know, forward to technology um, and, and computation and wireless just, just everywhere and, and allowing us to do right. things beyond what we can do now. Um, so I, I'm wearing a STEAM t-shirt today um, because I know that I'll be speaking with you. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I know that U.S. Unite um, supports and, then, you know, um, I, I know STEM, but I add A for art, um, and a lot of people are doing that. So uh, yeah. for STEAM students all over the world, say in third world countries, um, could they use such connection to um, look at a microorganism under a 4K microscope online or operate in real time with your technology? Yeah, absolutely they can. And I shall talk about a project in Chattanooga that I'm, I'm very proud of in a moment. But I want to say first, thank you so much for adding the A there, the art portion of it, right? That mm -hmm. Contextualizing things and coming up with the reason why we're doing this is probably paramount. It's, it's not enough just to do things anymore. People want to know how is it going to impact my life. So getting a full community discussion going around how we're using it, what's capable of doing it, how, we can, how, how can this become a, a, a tool to break down barriers instead of sort of creating these siloed uh, uh, experiences that we're having online right now, I think. It's hugely important. So thank you for adding that A. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and I, I actually have a story with that A. Um, I, oh, go ahead. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, so I, I was a, I was a, I was a photo professional photographer, and I do runway shots. And um, it's interesting because every time I go to a runway, people think I'm a model instead of a photographer. Um, you know, photography is an art, right? And a lot of times when I do take professional um, pictures of different models, I'm always the only woman in, you know, a group of guy prof uh, professional uh, photography professionals. Um, so, really? That's a problem in photography? I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. I mean, like not in, you know, uh, amateur photography, but in professional okay. photography. Um, you know, there's it's always... It's a well-known problem in IT, so I was surprised to hear it. it's a problem in photography as well, but it's a very well-known problem in yeah, IT it, it, that it we was... definitely need to fix, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I tend to do things that I want to do and I'm interested in, regardless whether there's you know, male or female there, you know, but I just noticed right. that, you know, some of the interests that I have, um, you know, in, in terms of photography, there's usually a lot of uh, male photography photographers, and they're really, even uh -huh. in the cameras owners of the Bay Area photography group that I was in before meetups.com was born, you know, there were, in, in that community, there were like all males except for like a few women. And, you know, oh, wow. so I really appreciated the, the A in STEAM. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I, actually, if I could touch base on that, I, I, I would love to, so there's something on, uh, you know, diversity is something we absolutely need, but a, a perfect example of why, in tech, but across the board, mm -hmm. a perfect example of why is really resonant in art. It's most, most demonstrated by art to me, that um, you know, technology, like art, you know, art is the sort of expression of a vision, and technology is a sort of a, a manifestation of a conceptual model. Right. Mm -hmm. If someone has a conceptual model and they make a product around it. And so technology and our advancements in it are generally limited to the conceptual models of the people creating the technology or coding it or whoever, whatever their role is in that. Right. right. So that and we've been able to accomplish a lot, but on a very narrow set of people backgrounds, right, that have a similar set of conceptual models. And I think really, I, I very much believe that if we want to achieve sort of new spurs in the economy, next next waves of the economy, we have to open that more broadly to get all kinds of conceptual models. And there are people who think drastically differently about many of these problems, both, both from the governance side down to the technology implementation side. So I think you can be absolutely self-centered and greedy and still really find uh you know diversity incredibly important as the next sort of one of the next requirements for a spark in the economy and a spark in uh, so the next generation development so anyway thanks i really appreciate the, um, that that point of view yeah so thank you for sharing that. yeah you're welcome i um i uh 
I recently also spoke with someone. Just your point about conception and execution. Um, I think I was talking to a gentleman like a week ago, and we were talking about intellectuals versus executors, and how right. sometimes the left hand doesn't really know what the right hand is doing, and how you know when you build something, you know you really need to have more of a unified um, body, right? Um, that right. you know the concepts are important. Of course, the coding and the execution are important, right? And then you know, of course, you have the business people, and you have you basically move everything moves parallel forward. Um, that's right. You know, to make things work. So you know, and, and that's why diversity is so important because you know people have different perspectives, different experiences, um, right. different uh, different views, and different solutions um hopefully yeah. to solve a problem and you know we kind of we need that as a society right to to change right. the world i mean to make innovation to execute it as well and and you know and to sell you know if, it, if it's commercial right right and and you just have to get along with people too I and mean, we don't have time for that old school like nonsense of, of cutting certain people out and playing gatekeeper, you know, technology is great at bashing down gates. And I think we need to allow more of that to happen. So yeah, I really am. I, I really appreciate you, know, you sharing that. That, that was a great point of view. I did promise a story about Chattanooga, by the way, I'd love to deliver that because Chattanooga sure. is a great community and I don't want to leave them hanging. So your, your original question was really around, um, and we get off on the steam thing. So thank you for that. For that. But there's around sort of the capabilities that can be brought to a community. I wanted to highlight a project. There's a community out Chattanooga, Tennessee. I, if people haven't been there, I cannot recommend it more highly. It's really, it's a wonderful community there and their, their network will spoil you. Um, I mean, I've been in some pretty high speed communities, but I go there and I, the, the experience I get on their network is just like, Oh my God, why can't I live here? Uh, it's just <laughs> tremendous. They have, a, they have a great program that really does feature diversity. So it's a 4K mic, a remote control microscope. So it was really founded with a partnership originally um, in, um, um, a, at the University of California to Chattanooga, but they've since initiated a program locally in one of their STEM schools. And what it does, it takes a, a microscope, a high-power uh, remote controllable microscope that is an interface that can operate to the Internet. They connect a 4K camera to it. And over a gigabit network, they're able to send live, real-time, 4K imagery to any school that would connect to it. And the students in that classroom can connect, uh, control the microscope in real time. So they can have someone at the STEM school, the students there are getting the, the experience of running that program, like scheduling time on the microscope, uh, advertising it, mounting it, preparing slides for samples that might be sent in. And then when they mount it, a school that's remotely, it can be somewhere else in Tennessee, or it could be across the country, which we've done those demos before. They can let the students in that classroom control it. Uh, they're moving towards an Xbox controller right now. So it delivers the power of sort of high-end scientific instrumentation to any school that can get a connection. And that can be out in the third world. It can be anywhere here in, um, in, in communities in the U.S. that don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. So, and so schools don't have to drop 60,000 or 100,000 on their own microscope. They really get access to these very high power equipment. And as you know, in STEM, that is one of the big barriers. It's even in computer science, if you can't afford a computer, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get into it, right? Yeah. Same thing with scientific instrumentation, whether that's astronomy, microscopy, uh, physics to get access to um you know, LHC or the uh, or gas gas chromatographs or something like that. That's really, uh, I think, that real time responsiveness is a real, has great potential for scientific instrumentation. Yeah, I, I'm actually currently I have a I wrote a superhero story uh, that I wanted to create in AR VR, and I have MacBooks, uh, MacBook Air, and a MacBook Pro. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my gosh, I need a lap, uh, a PC, and I need a PC that is different from normal PC so that I can run AR, VR uh, software in there and also use their headset. Um, so, right. you know, and those are like a couple thousand dollars, sometimes 10000 So it's really, you know, we're talking about assets, right? And, you know, th really thinking about the world and and you know uh, just really um how people have access to technology so even if they want to do this they couldn't because um you know it costs a couple thousand uh to buy the equipment and also uh it, you know the accessories as well so you know and, and they might not yeah. have the network to to do that 
That's right. That's right. So yeah, that's why I mean, that's one of the things I mean by reprioritizing sort of expenditures. We really need to think, think about how do we get these into the hands of potential students? Because yeah, I mean, we really need to ask ourselves: is the is the cure for cancer sitting in some uh, in some s small uh, village that that never you know that never really got to, to get access, so that was never found because it's sitting there untapped. And we really mm -hmm. need to think about things. Uh, you know, we want to. We're looking forward. I love, I, you know, I, I tend to love sci-fi over fantasy because not to knock either one, but I like sci-fi because it imagines where we're going, right? Who do we want to be? That's the greatest question you can ask yourself. And and so if we look for SpaceX or opening of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know NASA's collaboration with um, the EU or any of these sort of future programs, uh, I think that we that's the world I want to build. And we need to tap the entire globe to be able to do that, enable them to run anything from a small business that maybe just serves their local community mm -hmm. up to getting involved in SpaceX if they want to. Let's, let's talk a little bit about time. And, you know, I'm fascinated by time. Um, you know, I think Jeff Bezos, uh, one of his favorite, favorite books is, I think, right. is, I've read it, I forgot the title, it's, it's about time management. And, you know, time management is just not personal time management, but, you know, also time management of, you know, of a business, uh, but also, right. you know, time management of innovation and how society changes because of technology. Um, in history, uh, just in a really short time, we have different innovators that change the U.S. Uh, economy by different inventions. Um, how do you think, like, what is your time frame or predictions of time frames of how do you think U.S. would change or how the world would change? Once I think we're in the midst of it. I mean, I think five years is going to be crazy. I mean, people aren't going to really, people are not going to be able to imagine the world five years from now because I really think we're going to have People are going to start to see self-driving cars much more strongly. Mm -hmm. AI is going to make bigger pushes into into medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do it right, and there's obviously concern about the governance here, right? And, yeah. and the fact is, and, and I say this as a as sort of a middle-aged white guy myself, right? Uh, there's a lot of middle-aged white guys sitting on top of this, <laughs> and <laughs> and they're they're wedded to old ways of doing business. So we have to. These are our friends, and these are my colleagues, and so I would I would I would uh, gently say to my colleagues that uh, we need to stop thinking of old business management processes, that mm -hmm. agile just isn't some buzzword that came into business. It's, a, it's literally around cutting out the fluff, the things you don't need, uh, maybe the personalities that are slowing a business down, mm -hmm. that we really need to focus on well-meaning, well-intentioned people who are open to new, new ideas, can think positively about the future, that, that can do process just enough to be useful because process is important, especially I'm an older, so I'll, I'll, I'll pull the old man card out on the benefit side here for a second, which is process Process can sort of focus you on the things that are very important, um, but it's only useful up to that point. Past there, then it's just culture. And culture that gets in the way of progress has no utility to anyone, not even the culture pushing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sometimes we need to balance process uh, with culture and, and time. <laughs> um, and, and I, I love that universities, I would say they're, you know, they're, um, they have the greatest potential, I think, for transformation once, that, once that's achieved there, and I think it will be. Uh -huh. um, I think we're really going to see it open it up in terms of the experience of university students going there, the capabilities that they're able to achieve as part of their, uh, as part of their um you know, their, their educational experience and also the researchers there, I think once we really tune that in a way that integrates not just the STEM uh, faculty, but faculty maybe in the humanities and blends them a little bit more, mm -hmm. I think we'll really see a lot of great research coming out of those centers. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, uh, I am uh, interested in AI and, and I'm interested in computation because I think, you know, we need, um, I think computation will power AI. Um, mm -hmm. And I think now, you know, with like the cost of GPUs and things like that, um, it's still pretty expensive um, to to run an AI project. Um, so I think right. I think that you know if we distribute it or, or really allow more people access to it, um, I think will be super awesome. Yeah, I, I think I think that's very true. I think distributed edge computing and so and. Uh, some some maybe cost reduction in hardware are really going to be short term benefits there. I uh -huh. think long term though, with AI, we need to get a better window into what's going on there because it's going to be mediated for some time, right? We're not going to just turn 
wholesale uh, parts of the country over to AI. It'll be some mediated uh, participation. But I think, to me, the biggest challenge for AI is not getting a, an effective picture into why mm -hmm. it's making its decisions, especially dynamic AIs. Like scripted AIs, you can you can figure out why they're doing what they're doing, right? But yeah. true machine learning, I mean, we need to develop a, a – we, we don't even have a method right now. We need to develop a method uh, in the midterm of understanding why it's doing what it's doing so we can – we can either adapt it or we can adapt to it. As mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. Um, I wanted to discuss, um, I know that U.S. and I, um, it's a lot about wired and wireless um, technology and, and smart cities. And I want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, of course, emergency, right? Um, what right. happens when there is no internet um, and no wired or wiredness? Um, you know, what, what is your opinion on, on, you know, that, I mean, you know, like for, for the hurricanes, uh, you right. know, where there is no internet and, you know, no energy, um, how do we, how do we stay smart? Um, you know, and I, I think I have some friends who are really talking about creating, um, technologies that allow us to communicate even offline, you know? Right. No, that's a great question. I think, especially given the, the recent events we had with the wildfires and also the hurricanes, I think that there's some potential. First, we have too much concentrated technology in one place and maybe just one or two lines going to a place. We need distributed, mm -hmm. we need distributed compute platforms, distributed technology. Then we also need a distributed power grid. Power grid is half of the reason why most of this stuff goes out. That mm -hmm. technology itself might work, but the power is knocked out. So we need to make I think significant pushes into distributed power grid and then a distributed compute platform. If you had thousands of IoT devices that essentially worked as a single uh, compute platform for a city, it'd be mm -hmm. very different. And if it can maintain power anyway, it'd be very difficult to knock that city out. Um, so that type of resilience, I think, is very important. Deployable, low-powered, long-distance devices, actually, that might even be a little bit lower in bandwidth but more reliable. There's a, a program called Serval, which is out of a um, – Chat Australia, which is sort of these, we you can just literally duct tape these things to a um, to a, a telephone pole and put a solar cell out on them, and they have low power connectivity that you can form a mesh network in the city. So there, there's there's I think possibilities to do that distributed both in the IoT sense and in the power uh, power generation sense. I think are absolutely vital for that. Yeah, that sounds uh, super awesome, Scott. Um, this is uh, KZSU Stanford 90.1 FM. Again, this is DJ uh, Laptop at Laptop Radio. We're talking with Scott Turnbull at US Ignite. Um, and uh, Scott, you know, of course, we're at a Stanford radio station. Um, so I think a lot of people are in the community are listening um, to you. And, you know, do you want to really adjust or, or you know, like say like a words of advice for all the Stanford um, people here? Yeah, I would say, you know, Stanford's a great community. Um, you're doing great work there, but get outside of it a little bit. There's uh, there's a lot of the country uh, that have adapted needs. Um, don't get lost in Silicon Valley. It's a great place to be. But places like Chattanooga, Kansas City, Burlington, Vermont, Austin, these are fantastic cities you can get out to those. They're, they start thinking about where you can not just make a product, but sell it. Uh, there's a lot of comp uh, there's a lot of competition in the area that'll help you hone that idea, and I think it's a great place to really incubate things. But when you, you've got hungry communities out there that can really do a lot of adoption for you, so seek those partnerships. Really get to know your local, uh, not just people in IT, but people, your users, people in government, people in uh, nonprofit spaces. Really get to know your community very well. That's probably my number one advice. How do people how do people do that? How do people reach out to different people in that in those communities when you you know, we're kind of in this little Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's that's uh, so. US Ignite helps do that a little bit. Um, most of these centers have, most of these cities have an entrepreneurial area. That's a good place to start if you do it. So get with that local uh, incubator or entrepreneurial nonprofit. That is a great place to reach out. The other thing, though, is just develop social skills. Uh, I, I've been very blessed. The truth is I, I, I like people a lot. Mm -hmm. I love to meet and talk to people uh, of all ages, of all backgrounds. And it really is something I really enjoy about my job. So develop that as a skill. Anything can be learned. You know, don't, uh, this, is, this is fun. How, how lucky are we that we get to do this, right? So keep in mind that it's fun. Like what you like. Find people who like it, too. Be friendly and, uh, and contact those entrepreneurial centers and just keep it up over time. You, you'll, you'll be surprised how many people you get to know. 
Awesome. Um, and I've been really thinking about something you said、um, prior about being inclusive and really working with different people. You know, I know there's not a class for that in school. So, you know, I just want to close off by asking you, you know, what is just your one piece of advice, you know, to us, you know, about on working together and just really building that harmonious relationship? Um, I think be open to other people's ideas. There's a great old saying that I love that、uh, don't, don't be easily offended nor easily offend. I think that sitting there talking to, idea, talking to people about their ideas, listening to what they have to say, but also have the courage to speak your mind and say what's on, where, really where you're coming from. I think that's it. But with an honest and open heart, people,、uh, people really appreciate、um, uh, genuineness and authenticity. And come at everybody with that, and I think you'll find.、Uh, You'll find a lot of friendly people out there. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you a lot.、Um, that was an awesome talk.、Um, everyone, this is Laptop Radio. 